is Billy Cox with the Band of the Gypsies and the Jimmy Hendrix Experience. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. You know, we've done many, many books on Bob Dylan because he assisted me and, and five billion others. <laughs> five other five billion other planetary souls to get through some very, very hard times. Yet just a year or so ago, while attending a Willie Nelson concert with uh, Bob Dylan was uh, going to follow him, I was so bored with his attitude that I and my friends decided to just walk out. And frankly, we felt damn good about it because going to the going to the shows all oh, 10, 20, 30 years ago is so much different than it is now. You know, I was thrilled, however, to learn of the book Bob Dylan, New York by June Skinner Sawyers. And here's what the blurb on the book's back cover uh, that persuaded me uh, to really, really enjoy it. Quote, this is the only book devoted to untangling the relationship between New York and Dylan. It explores his public and private lives in the city, captures the spirit of a changing time, and features more than 50 sites where he lived, worked, and played. Street maps let the reader navigate from Café Wa to the Chelsea Hotel, from Columbia's Studio A to his apartment on 4th Street, now good old positively 4th Street, and to all other landmarks in Dylan's New York Odyssey. June Skinner Sawyers has written or edited more than 20 books on subjects such as, <laughs> as we used to call it when we were there, Greenwich <laughs> Village, yes, Greenwich Village, uh, Springsteen, and the Beatles, the Beatles, we used to call them the Beagles. Uh, she is a columnist for the Chicago Tribune. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, June. Thank you very much. June. Who was Woody Guthrie in the heart and mind of Bob Dylan? Oh, Woody Guthrie was his uh, his, uh, his mentor. Um, once he heard Woody Guthrie, his whole life changed. He became enamored. He became Woody Guthrie up to a point until he became somebody else. And that somebody else was uh, Bob Dylan. That is, Robert Zimmerman became eventually... Bob Dylan, but in between, there was Woody Guthrie. Mm -hmm. Now, who do, who was Bob Dylan in the mind and heart of Woody Guthrie? Well, in, 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 interesting question. Uh, Guthrie um, and Dylan did meet when you know, Guthrie was um, was uh, very sickly, um, and Guthrie was impressed with um, how much Dylan knew about his music, knew about Guthrie's music. And um, so up until the day that they met, Guthrie didn't know who he was. But um, when they finally did meet face-to-face, -face, um, he was impressed with this uh, rather strange young man um, who came from Minnesota. Uh, but before that meeting, was it Arthur Arlo Guthrie that met with Dylan and... Uh, yes, they, yes. Uh, uh, Dylan went to uh, try to find uh, Guthrie's house in um, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, near Coney Island, and he um, he ended up um, knocking on the door. And a uh, very young Arlo Guthrie was there, and Guthrie was impressed not with um, with more, more with what Dylan was wearing. I think he was <laughs> the, the, the boots he was wearing or something. <laughs> um, he thought he was rather a strange figure who wanted to know everything about his father. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed. There's so many things I enjoyed about this book. I mean, oh, I know you probably were uh, uh, not too happy with my introduction and walking out on Dylan's concert. Oh, not at all, because I, I don't blame you. Because he's 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 the anti-showman. He's the anti-Springsteen. Uh, he has his back to the audience most of the time. Yeah, I got so tired. I, yeah, of that. I, I understand. I mean, I, I didn't see him years ago. I just saw him um, only three times, four times in the last maybe uh, half a dozen years, maybe mm -hmm. maybe eight years. Um, so I didn't see Dylan during his heyday. So I don't know what he's like when you, so say, when you, if you saw him years ago. Well, I think uh, being an artist, uh, uh, you know, we're all group of us artists watching him. I mean, we're looking at God, you know. We were looking at, <laughs> we yeah. were looking at this fellow up there, and we I, felt just as uh, well unsure of ourselves, I guess, uh, as he did when he first, you know, because a number of us sang, sang in the village. 
back, right. back in the, I mean, it didn't take anything to sing, sing in the village. All you had to do was have a guitar. And uh, we, 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 used to, we used to go to a number of places. A lot of people did. This is not just something I did. Right. But you, for, you know, for a couple of beers, <laughs> you right. go in. And I remember one time I was singing uh, one of Bob Dylan's songs, and it was a 20-minute song. I just made it all up, you know, after, <laughs> and it was thrilling. I didn't yeah. know what I said afterwards. So, but it brought down the house. They offered me free beers for the rest of the night. There you go. And that was enough because you're not going to get paid much, or at least we weren't. But right. but Dylan didn't make out bad there economically in the beginning, though. Not too bad. Uh, well, of course, it was much cheaper then. And what did he pay per month in his apartment on Fourth Street? Like sixty bucks or whatever it was a month. I mean, yeah, things yeah. have changed since then. You think it's more than sixty <laughs> bucks a month now, huh? Right. Yeah. Well. Mine was 50, and it was... <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, but you had to deal with all the rats and all the other stuff. Now... Oh, well, it comes to the territory. Yeah, it sure does. Rats and roaches. That's what we used to call R&R. When everyone was referring to R&R as something oh, else, or rock and roll, or this rest and relaxation, uh, we were talking about rats and roaches. Because is that right? It was yeah. the inevitable... That was more accurate, I guess, eh? Yeah, sure, because we all learned the, the magic was when you go up to your apartment, and you turn on the light. Do not go in. Mm. Don't go in right away. And uh. do not open your eyes. Uh. Because if you did, you would see this brown wall move. Oh, my God. And, of course, it would turn into a pale white or something like that. And, and But but the, the, the rule was, don't do it. Just... <laughs> Not very glamorous. <laughs> oh, being an artist is always glamorous. You know yeah. that. Now, what was New York like in the early 60s? And... And uh, well, we'll answer that one first, and then we'll get into what attracted Dylan to it. Well, New York, uh, at the time that he uh, left Minnesota, was, of course, much cheaper and much uh, safer, although it's safe now again. But for you know, a big chunk of time, and especially in the late 70s and 80s, it was not very safe. But when he went there, it was just, um, it was just coming out of the, 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 um, the 50s era, and um, so, uh, especially going down to the village, everything was sort of was wide open, and you can do whatever you want. And you could, you can. I mean, he went to Cathy Wall the, the day he arrived. He was playing in the coffee houses the day he arrived. And mm. can you imagine anything like that happening today? I Not don't, so much. I don't yeah. think so. No. Mm -hmm. no. That's a completely different uh, era, completely different uh, atmosphere. And uh, he was really in the right place for him at the right time. What attracted him to the, I mean, you know, it was a big thing for him to come here from uh, where he was coming from. Well, uh, yes and no, but uh, he, he deliberately chose New York because New York was his point of reference. Everything that he knew about the world growing up in Minnesota, of interest anyway, everything came out of New York. He had to go to New York. To him, it was the capital of the world. Yeah. It was the right place for him to be at that right time. Was he reading the Beats? Then, oh yeah, he was reading the yeah, yeah about the beats in in uh, in Dinky Town, as the neighborhood was called, and uh, is called in, in Minneapolis uh, by the university where he attended. Well, sort of attended, not really attended, but he was officially a student at the University of uh, Minnesota at Minneapolis. Um, yeah, he was he was into beats, he was into Guthrie, he was into um, uh, folk music, acoustic m music. He had gone away from. Rock and roll, because rock and roll has become bland by the late 50s, early 60s. Elvis went to the army and all of that. So he had turned his attention to authentic music, which is which he meant is to be folk music, uh, Guthrie. And um, so, but he was listening to that and, and reading the beats, and just uh, just the, his mind his mind is like a sponge, just 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 learning and endless curiosity. Well, as you said, he headed for Cafe Wa and. He started his New York City career. What part did Cafe Wa and Cafe Bazaar in Mill's House or Tavern Yeah, uh, play? all of those are part of it, but especially the Gaslight. Uh, that's where he had a, a, a residency there for a time, and that's when the Live the Gaslight was, um, was put out not just a few years ago. Um, but that was in October 19, what, 62, um, when he had his residency there, and um, that led to... Uh, um, you know, bigger venues. I mean, within you have to remember that within a short period of time, he had grown, he had outgrown the coffee houses of the village. 
um, and had moved further uptown mm-hmm. to the town hall, to uh, Carnegie Hall, to Philharmonic. This is all happening within a matter of years, just a few years. That was extraordinary. Yeah. I, just, I mean, it's, it's remarkable how, how fast he grew out of the, the Greenwich Village coffee, coffee house scene. Well, let me say one thing. It's, uh, well, a number of things are remarkable about uh-huh. this book. Oh, mm-hmm. And that deals with the maps, the ah, maps mm-hmm. and the numbers. You know, uh, it's wonderful to be able to see, you know, it's from 1 to 50 or so. Yeah. And and to be able to pinpoint exactly where they are. And any of us who spent some time up there in the village, I mean, it was, we, I can, my head can walk through these streets. Yeah, the good thing is that many of them are, I mean, many are gone, of course, but yeah. many of the uh, the buildings are still there. Not all, but you know, quite a few of the buildings were still there. And I had the good fortune of being um, at what is now the 116 McDougal, not, uh, with the, the former Gaslight, which has reopened. It reopened after the book came out, just in in May of this year. In celebration of your book. Yeah. yeah. Just in time. Good yeah. going. Yeah. Even. So, it, um, so it, you know, the village, of course, has changed a lot. But um, some of the coffee houses, like uh, Cafe Reggio, is still there, and Cafe Dante is still there, um, all you know around the, the McDougal and Bleecker Street area. So even though, of course, the rents have certainly changed, <laughs> increased, and, uh, but the, many of the buildings are still there. So if you do choose to go to New York and walk around the village and uh, elsewhere in, in Manhattan, you will certainly see a site associated with Dylan, and that's the fun thing about the book. Yeah, well, there are a lot of fun things about yeah, the book. Yeah, okay, well, right. the way, yeah, you're, <laughs> you write damn well. Yeah. Uh, you you feel like uh, when you start reading it, you don't want to put it down. And uh. yeah, I got very upset when I came to the ending of the book. Uh. You needed you needed to have another hundred pages here, dear. Uh, you know, I, I know, been... but this is part of um, part of a series, uh, the music and play series uh, that the um, publisher, which is a small indie house based in Berkeley, has uh, put together. So. Um, it's just uh, meant to be an you know, introduction to a musician and the uh, the city that he or she was affected by and influenced yeah. by. Well, still would have liked to have had another hundred pages, no matter what you say. Oh, maybe the, maybe the, the next edition. Then. Good. Maybe you have part one and part two. There you go. That's yeah, a good idea. that's right. Now, well, uh, what were Dylan? You meant we touched a little on Woody Guthrie there, but what were Dylan's first meetings with Woody Guthrie like? Right. Well, he went to visit uh, Guthrie at the uh, hospital in New Jersey, where he was um, he was ill, and um, he, they um, they shared uh, songs. He sang him songs. He sang Dylan sang Guthrie Guthrie songs, or, you know, songs that Guthrie either wrote or sang to Guthrie. So um, that that's a remarkable thing too to me how. Um, they got along so well, and then you know it was a short period of time. And here is this very young, you know, barely out of his teens, really, young man who is visiting this this uh, icon, this, this American icon. And it's remarkable how they were able to talk to each other and communicate to each other through not just words but through song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, right now, we need to stop communicating to take a break. All right. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about Washington Square Park, where folk singing got its start in the 40s. Uh, That was before I went up there. Uh, And in the summer of 61, where Dylan met Suze Rotolo, and I think she just passed on. Yes, she did. February. uh, What, February of this year? Yeah, February 25th. Um, and uh, the, uh, we got a number of other things to talk about, especially positively for Street. I think that was our national anthem because it seemed like everywhere we were going, we were <laughs> in that. Right. We were inside. He was singing songs that were part of our lives, and he didn't even know it. <laughs> right. yeah, that's the, the magic of Dylan. That's right. that's right. Well, our guest is June Skinner Sawyer's Bob Dylan, New York, part of the music. Place series, the Roaring Forties Press. Order it from the link on 21stCenturyRadio.com. Hi, this is Steve Boone, bass player of the Class of 2000 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, The Love and Spoonful, and you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob. 
Our guest is June Skinner Sawyers, Bob Dylan, New York, part of the Music Place series, the Roaring Forties Press. All right, geez, a whiz. June, this time's going so fast, I better shut up. Now, Washington Square Park, where folk scene got its start in the village in the 40s. A lot of 40s going on here. Uh, yeah, that's when it started. Was it, was it uh, of any importance to Dylan's New York experience? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, he was a uh, part of that. Maybe not. He maybe doesn't get the press. The other um, singers, like you know, Pete Seeger, is probably associated more with Washington Square Park than Dylan was. But he certainly was was there. He was when, he, especially when he first arrived in New York, he would have um, hung out there and uh, played guitar there, like so many other musicians in the in the city at that time. So it was certainly part of his uh, informal uh, musical education, definitely. Well, in the summer of 61, Dylan met Suze Rotolo. Uh, under, yeah. Where and under what circumstances? Well, uh, the um, she remembered meeting him. Uh, it was late July of uh, 61. Um, there was, a, there was He was performing as part of a, Dylan was performing as part of a marathon folk concert at a, um, a beautiful church, which is still there, on the upper uh, west side called Riverside Church. And um, she thought he was... Um, uh, rather uh, curious and entertaining and uh, sort of, uh, I think she described him as uh, funny, engaging, and persistent. Oh, he was persistent. <laughs> Quote, <right>? unquote. <laughs> yeah. I can see him doing that, yeah. Yeah, so she was impressed uh, by his intensity, and uh, they just uh, hit it off, and she was so influential, again, in his unofficial education. She sure which, was, wasn't she? Yeah, it, which introduced him to all kinds of influences, uh, theater, um, um, uh, the art world, mm -hmm. um, just a, a lot of um, ideas that he never really thought about until she brought it to his attention. Oh, yes, you know, he... Uh, th when she died of lung cancer on yeah. uh, February 25th, did, did Dylan respond in any way to her passing? Not that I know of. But then again, he didn't even attend, as far as I know, when Mary Travers died. Uh, I, okay. I, I didn't hear of any reaction mm. from him. Yeah, He wasn't at her funeral like many other people were associated with, with the village at that time. At least it wasn't reported that he was there. So maybe he did something privately. I, I, I well, I hope know. he did because he owed, he, he owed her a lot. You know, uh, this is yeah. one of the problem with men who generally are kind of like idiots about this. They really don't give enough credit to the people that have helped them move along, especially when they're women. Right. And that is really tragic because right. uh, that's that's the biggest problem in our culture today, unfortunately. But we can't touch about that. That's yeah. against rules and regulations 506 of the Penal Code. However, Positively 4th Street is one of my favorite songs by Dylan. Tell us about his days at 161 West 4th Street and its effect on his work. Well, you know, I you know, I, I know people. Most people uh, uh, believe that the song is about Fourth Street in the village. Now, there are others who who question that, and they think it may be about Fourth Street in Dinkytown oh. in, in Minneapolis. So, hey, I can see the parallel there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows for sure? Yeah. Um, but, but whether it's Fourth Street in in Dinkytown or Fourth Street in the village, it was certainly he was living there for. Like, 60 bucks or so a month. It was part of his, again, of his education in, in, in being in New York and um, just being so close to the action. If you, if he, when he lived on at uh, on Fourth Street, he can, he can just walk. He can, he can just walk any, everywhere to mm -hmm. the coffee houses, yeah. to the theaters, to the to the pubs, to the White Horse Tavern, for example. Everything was within walking distance. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of that to his career and to his creativity. Mm -hmm. He was surrounded by so much artistic life. Well, that's why I thought it was the 4th Street in New York City and not elsewhere. Mm -hmm. but, right. but what the hell do I know, right? You know, I never talked to him, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, and I don't even know if he'd tell me anyway. If I did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, now, the, the, the time's running out. What was huh. Dylan's experience with the Ed Sullivan Show? This was really something. Oh well, he he was supposed to be on there, but uh, they uh, the executives had a problem with a John Birch song because they thought it was um, controversial. It referred to communism, you know, again a different era. 
but so they didn't want they asked that he not they demanded that he not sing the song so that really upset him he, they asked him to sing a Clancy song a Clancy Brothers song um, as a replacement now, he was a big fan of the Clancy Brothers but he did not want to sing a Clancy Brothers song he wanted to sing the song that he had intended to sing yeah. But they said no, so he uh, walks off during rehearsal, and he never appeared in the Ed Sullivan show for Isn't that reason. That song? Boy, he's got some guts there. Yeah. Uh, Dylan had become unwittingly the voice of a generation. Why was he uncomfortable with that label? Oh, he hated it. That, that wasn't yeah. his intent. No. To, he didn't want to be a spokesman for anybody, never mind a generation. Yeah. He just wanted to sing his songs and do his thing and not have to represent the entire all the young people of the world. That was that was not what he wanted to do with his with his with his music. Well, I still don't treat he think he treated Joan Baez with the proper respect. But that's funny my thing bias. is, well, I mean, when he did when the Baez uh, documentary aired not too not too long ago, apparently they have been still been in touch. Good God. And he still refers to her very endearingly as, as Joni. So I thought that was sort of a nice touch. Well, I'm glad he did. Uh, maybe he's grown up at this particular time. Maybe. Well, you know, geniuses, he's seven years old, so maybe, yeah. Yeah, geniuses <laughs> make mistakes just like everybody else. And, right. And he was that, a young guy at the time. So yeah, yeah, he was a young guy. And the next incarnation, he'll probably come back as a woman and then see what that feels like. You never know. Yeah, I, I think so. I, that, that's he has it. so many personas, right? So yeah. You never know what's, what he's going to come up with next. Well, thank you, June. I really enjoyed this work. It needed to be longer. Try to get them to do part two because I know you... Yeah, you write so well oh, that you. you make us feel like we're there during that oh, time. Oh, great. Right? Nice, to, nice to hear that. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. June Skinner Sawyers, Bob Dylan, New York, part of the Music Place series, Roaring Forties Press. Order it from the link on 21stCenturyRadio.com. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Courtner. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and remember to get a haircut.